Welcome to Makati Gospel Church in-person service. We're so glad you're worshiping the Lord with us today. Let's begin our worship by singing praises to our Lord together with the praise team to be led by Boksunyu. How are you? Usually we say, I'm fine, I'm good, but what if I ask, 
How is your life today? Is your life happy or confused? Is it satisfying or problematic? God paid a huge price for us to have this life, and we shouldn't wait and waste any second of it, especially for selfish gain. We should also never give up if we're constantly failing to live up to God's standard. Jesus' disciples also faced what we're experiencing. They did not understand most of Jesus' actions. So they kept asking questions, getting confused, and feeling frustrated with what they were doing. Yet, God continues to guide them. Later on, he sent Paul to encourage and keep his followers on the right direction. Let us all rise. In Romans 12, 2, 1 to 2, Paul saw the pressures of this world and declared. Let's read together. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We may in the world, but we should not be part of this world. Following the world might feel great, but it's only temporary, and at the end, will feel disappointment and empty. Instead, we should follow God. Doing so will make us better people, better family members, better friends, and even better business people. Exalting our Lord is the main reason why we are here in this world. Let us sing this song together.
God and enter into His presence. Come into His presence. news is found in John 3 16 17 Jesus loves us and wants us to love him back the Bible is God's love letter to us read it his people need to connect with him so may this next song be our response to him be seekers of God's heart know him love him enjoy him 
sing this song together. This song says, until we give God first place, until we let Him begin to fill us with His Spirit and renew us from within, nothing matters at all and nothing's gained. Without His holy presence, our lives are lived in vain. God knows that we need Him. He sees our need. That's why He's reaching out to us, waiting for us to come back to Him. How will we respond to Him today? Will we live our lives in response to His great love? Oops, let's sing this song again. Let's meditate on this song until we give Him the first place.
know you more and more. for the wonderful things you've given us. You give us hope in the midst of all the trials and challenges we face. You are our rock and our fortress. Lord, forgive us for our sins. We've fallen short of your glory. We acknowledge our shortcomings and yearn for repentance. God, you are the foundation which I build my life. You are the source of protection and strength. With you, I am never alone and feel abandoned. Thank you for making a way for me to know you. Please show me how you work in my life. I will choose to be patient with you because I know that you will finish the work you started in me. God, please grant our requests today. We'd like to pray for a missions fund. Please move our hearts to be able to reach the missions goal so we can continue to share your word to others. Many of us need your healing and protection, Lord. We pray for our loved ones who are down and sick. Touch their lives that you may give them hope, peace, and understanding that you alone can provide. We ask for wisdom to be able to make the right decisions which would glorify you. Grant us the courage and opportunity to share your word with others. Continue to show me how I can live a life that honors you. And this we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prepare our hearts to receive God's word through his servant, Reverend Colin Law. Hello, everyone. A great Sunday to all of you. It's a great day. And uh, just doing a sound check. Again, uh, Reverend Alex, can you hear me? Okay, I'm clear. Great. Good morning also to our audience, both on uh, Zoom and on YouTube. A great day to all of you. This is already our third message in our series, Why is the Bible Trustworthy? In the, the first two weeks, we talked about the reasons for the trustworthiness of the Bible. First, is we talked about its origin. It was breathed out. It was inspired by God. So it had divine origins, right? And last week, we talked about the, the, the excruciatingly uh, detailed process of copying the manuscripts until we have the printed Bible with us now, and, uh, and, and that copying process, we, we saw it, and we saw how many uh, ancient manuscripts we had. Remember? Remember the chart? There was a long line coming when we talked about the Bible, but with other books, there were only short bars. Okay, so we talked about those reasons. Um, the, the copying of the manuscripts is also an, uh, the second reason why the Bible that we have is trustworthy. Today we're going to talk about the third one, but before I talk about, go to the topic, I'd like to show you some pictures. You know, it's fun when you're on a road trip, you look at signs along the road, and sometimes you see signs that are a little bit off-center, shall we say that. Okay, here are some signs that I want to share with you first. Here is a sign. This is an organization that's supposed to be committed to excellence, but apparently not excellence in spelling. The second one. Oh, if you see this sign, what do you think? Is parking allowed? Is it fine? Or is parking prohibited? <laughs> Doesn't make it clear, right? Oh, this third sign. This third sign, all right, if you're paying $20, $40 a month, you better get more than messages and data. 
All right? So you get, <laughs> just read it. And this fourth one. Now, if ever someone, the, the church will be giving me an award for most, most patient pastor or whatever, please don't buy your trophy or the, you know, don't buy the trophy or the plaque from Trophy Land because it brings more than just trophies. They bring plagues. And lastly, if you're going swimming, I don't know. What makes the water here dangerous? Maybe the water's not clean, so don't swallow the water there. All right? Now, in the signs above, the misspelled words actually change the entire message. If you notice, if you look at that sign, parking, uh, parking prohibited, fine. Parking is fine for parking. What does it actually mean? Is it prohibited or is it fine? All right? So that, that error, that mistake actually changes the whole uh, meaning of the message. And of course, most, most people, you know, most of us commonsensical people will recognize the mistake. But I imagine there might be a few people who are pressed for time or who really need to park at, at once. They will risk an argument with a property owner in case they were confronted for parking on the property. So we see that mistakes like these can cause confusion and conflict. Now, some errors would have graver consequences than others. We just talked about parking. How about if you make an error in a computation? You're uh, filling out an invoice or you're sending a quotation to a customer. You make an error. You miss out one zero or, 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 or the digit nine. You, you turn it into six or some other digits, and it costs you a lot of money or your company. Or how about, how about this one? This is a true story. I like watching aircraft. Uh, on, on nation, uh, National Geographic aircraft air disaster investigation, right? There was one time uh, a ground maintenance crew saw that a screw was already deformed. He took it out. He, 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 he needed to replace it. But before he replaced it, he, well, it's already there, so he went to fix other items nearby, right? And the short, to make the long story short, after he fixed the other things, he forgot about the screw. He didn't change it. And that caused that aircraft on its next flight to crash. And so some mistakes will have graver consequences than others. Thankfully, thankfully, the word that God gives us does not contain errors like the examples I just shared. Not only does Scripture not contain errors, Scriptures cannot contain errors. Why? Because the God who gave it to us is a God who is perfect, loving, he's also truthful. Today we are going to look at one of the qualities of the Bible, and that is its inerrancy. And the title for our message today is Unerringly Given, Are There Mistakes in the Word of God? Before we proceed any further, let us come to the Lord in prayer. I want us to do something different today. Instead of me praying, I want all of us to pray simultaneously. Play, pray for the person on your left and on your right or the person behind you. If you know them, pray for them by name. All right? If not, just say, Lord, I pray for this person on my right. Pray that he or she will have attentiveness and that, that this person will hear, will, will, will learn the lesson that God has for him or her today. For you on YouTube and also on Zoom, please pray for others on, uh, on your screen. You may see the names of uh, other attendees on the screen. Please pick two out of those names. Pray for them. All right? And if you're on YouTube, pray for family members or anyone watching with you. Shall we? Shall we pray together? Pray for the person around you. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to work mightily, majestically in our midst, and that we will learn uh, what you have already uh, ordained that we will learn today. All these we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one of the main differences between evangelical Christians and people who call themselves um, liberal Christians is that 
um, the way they view the inerrancy of the Bible is very different. Evangelical Christians, that's us, we are considered evangelical Christians, believe that the Bible contains no factual or doctrinal errors, since the Bible was given by direct inspiration of God. On the, con on the other hand, so-called liberal Christians say that the Bible contains errors because it was written by men without any supernatural intervention of God. The theological term, when we say that the Bible contains no factual or doctrinal error, is inerrancy. What is inerrancy and what do we mean when we say that the Bible is inerrant? Let me give you one simple definition that you will remember and one technical definition that you will hear and forget. <laughs> We're all like that, okay? <laughs> Simply speaking, uh, inerrancy means that the Bible is without error. It is a belief in the total truthfulness and the reliability of God's words. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, he said, your word is truth. And so he, Jesus declared that the Bible is correct and true in everything that it teaches and declares. Now, this here next is the technical definition given by Paul Feinberg, a professor of systematic theology at the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He says, when all the facts are known, the scriptures in their original autographs and properly interpreted will be shown to be wholly true in everything they affirm, whether that has to do with doctrine or morality or the social, physical, or life sciences. How many of you will remember this? How many of you will remember the earlier one, the simple one? I think most of us will remember. It just, it just simply means the Bible is without error because it was given by God who is truthful and loving and powerful. Two, def two, um, two observations from this definition. First is that inerrancy applies only to the original autographs. The ones that Paul wrote, the, 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 the parchment that Paul wrote on, that Matthew, Mark, the prophet Isaiah, that the scrolls they wrote on, those are cons the ones considered inerrant. Remember last week we talked about the painstaking process of copying? That's why we need to, we want, that's why we, we, we have that, those kinds of processes, right? We want to find out what the original uh, manuscripts say. Now, inerrancy applies only to the original autographs, the prophets and the apostles who wrote the original books of the Bible were the ones inspired by the Holy Spirit. Those who copied the manuscripts were not under inspiration of God, but they were under the supervision. Anyone who does the work of God is under the supervision and the guidance and direction of God. And so those copyists were not under inspiration, but they were under the guidance of God. Sometimes what appears, second, second observation, sometimes what appears to be a factual error in the Bible could be the result of our incomplete understanding that leads to a wrong interpretation. Sometimes we, we may see inconsistencies in the Bible. Oh, why does it say this here and this? And it says a, a different thing in another book. And sometimes we, we don't understand. But it's not the Bible that is at fault. It is because of our faulty understanding. I'll give you an, an example that happened in the 17th century. I'll show you a passage. This is from Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 to 13. In this, uh, before the 1700s, people, um, people thought, okay, people had this idea that the earth was the center of the universe. It's called the a geocentric view, and that the heavenly bodies revolved around the earth. They saw this verse, Joshua 10. Many of the, the, the uh, believers at that time looked at Joshua 10, 12 to 13, where Joshua asked, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Aijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped. So, so it gives you the, the impression that it's the sun that's re revolving around the earth. So the earth seemed to be the center of the universe, okay? So um, 
So the guardians of the galaxy at that time thought it was this Earth was at the center of the universe. Now, of course, we know that later on, scientific advancements uh, proved that it was the sun that was at the center of the solar system, and the Earth and other planets revolved around it. So in this example, better understanding, the understanding of what we have now, uh, allowed us or led us to a com correct interpretation of this passage. And we realize that then when this was written, okay, the writer was writing from the, his own perspective, what he saw. Well, he saw, he saw that the sun stopped. He, couldn't, he didn't have a, a macro perspective of the solar system. He just saw that the sun was just there, and he wrote it down. He was writing from his own visual perspective. Our belief in the inerrancy of Scripture is rooted in our doctrine of God. God is tr trustworthy, and he is truthful. He cannot lie or speak falsely. Numbers 23, 19 says this about God. God is not a man that he should lie, nor, the son of, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. So when we talk about inerrancy of the Bible, it's very closely linked to our understanding of the character or the doctrine of God. So God is truthful and trustworthy. So what do you expect from a God like that? He will give you trustworthy words that are true, right? And um, secondly, God is also omniscient. He knows everything. So if he knows everything and he's truthful, he won't give you, he won't give us a lie, right? Um, so there's no fact, no circumstance, no data that is unknown to him. And so there's nothing in the Bible that comes out of, quote unquote, God's ignorance. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as God's ignorance. But there, okay, so there's nothing in the Bible that, that, that is expressed in the Bible uh, that is not known of, by God, okay? And thirdly, God is also loving and because he's loving, he will not give us anything that results in eternal harm for his people. He won't give us gospel poison. He won't give us um, half-truths that will lead us to eternal condemnation. Why? Because he's a loving God. And he wants us to be with him. And so he will not give us anything that will result in, in our eternal harm. Of course, there are times when God allows his people, whether it's Israel in the past or today, the church or us personally, he allows us to go through difficult trials, but that's for our own good, right? And these things actually build in us character and later on perseverance. So even the things that God gives us for, for our, that, that, that brings pain to us right now, is given for the purpose of purifying us. So when you put all these attributes of God together, his truthfulness, trustworthiness, wisdom, and his love, his concern for his people, you know that when God speaks, it will be free from error. Now let me tell you why belief in inerrancy is important. Some of you may, may be asking, Pastor, why is it important? Why do we need to talk about this? Right? Okay, why is inerrancy important? Can we believe that the Bible contains errors without, se without serious implications to our faith? Now, here are some reasons why belief in the inerrancy of the Bible is important. First, belief in inerrancy affirms the truthfulness, wisdom, and the righteousness of God. Error-free original writings can happen only if breathed out by a God who is at all times truthful, trustworthy, wise, and righteous. If this were not true, if it were not true that God is righteous and trustworthy, and suppose the Bible contained factual and doctrinal errors, suppose lang, ha? Okay, don't go around quoting, quoting, uh, quoting me and saying, you know, Pastor Collins said the Bible contains errors. No, suppose the Bible contained factual and do doctrinal errors. It would point to a source who is not loving or perfect in knowledge. Rather, it would point to a source who either lied or didn't have complete knowledge of what is true or someone who just intentionally, maliciously wanted to cause harm to people. But God is not, God is not like that. Second, 
Belief in NRC is important because it leads to deeper trust in God. Knowing that He has our spiritual and eternal well-being in mind when He breathed out the original writings, we would be more willing to place our trust in a God like this and follow His words toward eternal salvation. We would tend to believe His promises that He has given to us in His scriptures and that results in greater obedience as we experience more and more of his trustworthiness and his fulfilled promises. Third, belief in inerrancy expresses our submission to God and his word. The doctrine of inerrancy places the Bible beyond our control. We do not sit in judgment of the scriptures. Imagine if we don't believe in inerrancy, if, if if uh, we actually believe there are errors in the Bible, you know, what are you going to do during M group? What are you going to do when you read your Bible? You're going to search for errors. Is there any error in this passage I'm reading today? Is there any doctrinal, doctrinal mistake here? Is there any factual mistake? We'll be doing that. All right? And, 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 and we'll be focusing more on what, what errors are there rather than on what God wants us tell us. And so we do not sit in judgment on the, of the scriptures like judges looking for flaws in the arguments of a lawyer. Instead, it is the scriptures who judge us. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says that the word of God judges our thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. So we do not judge scriptures. Scriptures is our judge. It is the word of God that determines whether we are right or wrong not the other way around. Fourth, belief in an inerrant Bible results in doctrine that is stable and not subject to the whims of society. When we have a high view of the scriptures, we tend to regard it, we give it authority. It is authoritative as compared to, to those who see it as a human, as, as the work of a human being. Now, if you look at the Bible as just a human work, it's just written by men. What right do these men from the first century have over me today? Right? But because we know that the Bible has divine origins, we give it the authority that it should have. Finally, belief in inerrancy is important because Jesus himself regarded the Bible as the very word of God, perfect and trustworthy in every part. When teaching important principles, do you notice when you read the, new, the Gospels, when Jesus was going to teach something important, very often he uses, he starts the statement this way, it is written. And then he would quote from the Old Testament. What does that mean? There is authority in the scriptures. That's why Jesus appealed to the Old Testament. He, made, he quoted from the Old Testament. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. And by so doing, Jesus proclaimed and declared that the scriptures have authority and they are trustworthy. Here's some truths about the scriptures that Jesus taught. I'm going to read the verses one by one. We'll just go through it. Jesus taught in that in the scriptures, every word is inspired. He also taught that the Old Testament events actually happened. They are historical events. They really happened. That's why he talked about Adam and Eve. He talked about Jonah in the belly of the fish. He talked about the Egyptians coming out of the Red Sea. He said, all these things happened. They're just not myths and legends. Jesus also taught that the prophetic writings will be fulfilled. And the scriptures cannot be broken. Every single one will be fulfilled. He taught that uh, that the scriptures provide sufficient witness to divine truth and that God's word is entirely true. All these Jesus taught about the scriptures. And these show us, these verses uh, on the screen show us that Jesus had a high and exalted view of the scriptures. And that's why for us, we also want to adopt that, that, uh, that same uh, belief that the scriptures are God's words and they are perfect error-free, inerrant for us. 
A passage in the Gospel of Matthew gives us a good idea of the way Jesus viewed the Scriptures. Here he was teaching to a crowd and delivering what we call the Sermon on the Mount. This is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Okay, maybe we can all read together, shall we? Can we read together? Right, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says that he came not to minimize, not to set aside the importance of the law and the writings of the prophet. Rather, he came to fulfill them. He did not come to abolish. He came to accomplish the law. Jesus stated this because uh, there were Jewish religious leaders who were accusing him of trying to abolish or do away with the Old Testament because he was very critical of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day. You see, Jesus was critical of these Pharisees because they, were, uh, they, they represented strict adherence to the letter uh, of the teachings in the Old Testament. It's not all. You know, we think when we talk about Pharisees, when we talk about religious leaders, we think about people who are very uh, careful about obeying all the commandments in the Scriptures. But in this passage... Jesus revealed, okay, in the later, uh, we just read until verse 20, but what follows after that, Jesus was revealing the lack of obedience of these religious leaders. In their emphasis on the provisions of the law that were public in character, meaning that these were obeyed in public, in front of people. These people would recite verses on the street corners. Imagine Imagine Reverend Alex standing in, in uh, Buendia Corner, Chino Roses. There's a McDonald's. You think he's, he was going to line up to buy burger. But no, he's standing there in the corner. He's reciting scriptures. You walk a little further near RBC, RCBC building. You see me. And you think I'm going to share the gospel? No, I'm reciting verses for everyone to hear. That's what they did. They did things in public, okay? And, and, and many of these religious leaders, religious people disregarded commands that called for inner obedience. They disregarded the commands that called for cultivating an inner love for God and heartfelt compassion for people. They're very concerned with how they appeared in public, but Jesus knew their hearts. You look very pious in public, but deep inside you don't have devotion for God. You tithe, you help the poor, but deep inside you don't have compassion for people. You're doing it for show. And so Jesus told them, you neglect the laws on love and inner devotion because no one can see, no one can see that that is absent from you. No one can see your inside. Well, Jesus said, let me tell you, these are just as important. The laws that talk about building an inner, cultivating an inner devotion for God, having compassion for the poor, uh, the widows, and the foreigners, these are just as important. And because not even the most minor command, not the least letter, not the smallest letter, not a, not a dot in the scriptures will be set aside and disregarded. That's what Jesus said. So expose them. You, want, you, you, you make people think that you're obeying the whole law, but actually you're obeying only part of it. You set aside the inner obedience. And that's not good because you're disregarding the word of God. And he said in Matthew 5, 18, I tell you the truth, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything 
is accomplished. And in saying that, Jesus declared the entire Old Testament as valid, authoritative, and deserving of obedience. Implied here is that the entire body of scriptures consisting of the law, the prophets, and the writings did not contain any portion that needed to be revised or removed due to any error. So when Jesus said, not the least stroke of the pen, not, uh, not the smallest letter, he declared that every part of every letter that is there is supposed to be there because God placed it there. So now let us review what we have learned so far, okay? Here are some statements of uh, review. First, we learned that inerrancy simply means that the Bible in its original writings contains no factual and doctrinal errors. Number two, what may appear to be factual errors can be attributed to our incomplete understanding that results in wrongful interpretation. Number three, belief in the inerrancy of the scriptures is rooted in our doctrine of God, especially his truthfulness, his trustworthiness, his wisdom, and his love and concern for his people. And number four, we learned that belief in the inerrancy of the Bible is important. And it is important for the following reasons. It affirms the truthfulness, wisdom, and righteousness of God. It leads to a deeper trust in God. It expresses our submission to God and His Word. It results in doctrine that is stable and not subject to the whims of society. And uh, lastly, it reflects Jesus' regard for the Bible as the very Word of God, perfect and trustworthy in every part. Now we come to the portion that everybody loves. Everybody loves. It's hard to pull you away from your group discussions, you know? We have two questions for you. Number one, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be costly? Share the circumstances of your experience. I'm sure we've all committed mistakes, all right? Some more costly than others. List, uh, question number two, list and explain some of the characteristics of God that make it possible for Him to give us His Word and instructions without error. We talked about His truthfulness, trustworthiness, His love and concern for His people, and also His omniscience. Maybe there are other qualities of God that you know, that you can connect to the concept of inerrancy of the Bible. You can use what we've shared in the message. You can think of your own. That's great. All right, so let's... Find a partner, uh, group yourselves into two or three. We have five minutes for this exercise. If you see someone alone, can you invite that person to your group?
two minutes to go. Last one minute, last one minute. back to the message with me, right? I'd like to end by sharing with you three points of application from what, what we've learned. Three points of application. Number one is that, uh, you know, uh, as I read about many of people in the West who have changed their understanding of the inerrancy of the Bible, uh, one of the main problems for them uh, was the miracles. They regarded the miracles as too, my, too unbelievable that they said it could not be true. But of course, we know miracles in the hands of a God who is omnipotent, who can do, who can do everything that he wants. He's all-powerful. Miracles become possible. So the first application is consider miracles in the Bible as historical events. Why? Because definitely God can do it. Can we say that together? God can do it. One, two, three. God can do it. Number two, find solutions to conflicting and difficult passages in the Bible. Sometimes we're reading the Bible, and you know, and then you remember, I read a while, a few weeks back, that it was this big. Why now it is only this big? You know? So, so the numbers sometimes change, and when we do that, what, you know, uh, if we don't. If we don't pursue it, if we don't find the solution or the, or the answer, sometimes we may, you know, begin to think that there are errors in the Bible. And so here's a resource that I want to share with you. It's, called, it's a website called defendinginerrancy.com slash Bible difficulties. The QR code is there. You can take a picture and bookmark, bookmark it. Uh, it's, it's a catalog from Genesis to Revelation. And when you click, for example, you click on Genesis, a list will come out of supposed difficulties and errors. And each one, there's an explanation. Don't worry, the explanations are very short. They're not, they're not a five-page treatise, okay? It's very short. Just each, the resolution is just about one or two minutes of reading for each, all right? Uh, hey, you can even make it your hobby. Huh? Instead of watching Netflix or playing computer games, oh, I'm going to check all the Bible difficulties from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> All right, uh, number three, read articles and books on the trustworthiness of the Bible. And I'm going to share with you two, res two resources. One is long, one is a little bit, uh, one is short, 
Only five minutes to read. The other one is a little bit longer. It's a booklet, only five chapters. The first one is an article written by David Platt. It's entitled, Can We Trust the Bible? It gives us seven reasons why we can trust the Bible. All right? Let, let me give you a spoiler. You read all those seven, it's parang you attended five sessions of, of my message na. But of course, condensed. It's very short. Lang. It's just one paragraph explanation for each. Right? So it's there. Uh, you can, again, QR code. You can take a picture. The last one, the, 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 the last resource is a booklet. Not a book. Booklet. All right? Five chapters. The third chapter is about inerrancy. The title is, Can I Trust the Bible? Written by R.C. Sproul. It's a booklet containing five chapters. And it's, the best thing is that it's available for free. Yes, zero dollar on Amazon. And the good thing is, the better thing is, when you access this page, you can access many, I think there are 30 plus booklets written by R.C. Sproul. Uh, titles, very, uh, each one is a question, question mark. Each title is uh, expressed as a question. How can I have faith? Uh, uh, is the Bible, can I trust the Bible? Uh, is salvation eternal? Many intriguing questions about faith. An excellent resource for M group leaders. And again, all free, all 30 plus books, booklets, free for you to download on Amazon. All right? Uh, okay, that's it. And uh, I pray that your, your, your interest has been aroused. You'll take a look at these resources and be fed, strengthen your belief in the inerrancy of the Bible. Let's come together in prayer. Father, we thank you for the scriptures that you have given to us, life-giving word. Everything on earth will fade, wilt, and disappear, but your word stands forever. May your word continue to cleanse each one of the brothers and sisters here in MGC, those watching at home, either through Zoom or on YouTube, may your word affect us, transform us, change us, and even rebuke us, correct us when needed, because your word is authoritative. It is true. It is inerrant in every word. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is a Communion Sunday, and I'd like to ask Reverend Alex to come forward to lead us in our communion. Praise God that our Bible is inerrant. And thank you, Reverend Colin, for giving us our message today. Now we come to the communion. Before we start, does everyone have the communion cup, the communion pack? If not, please raise your hand. Anyone? Okay. We now come to the communion. Communion is a way for us to be able to remember what the Lord has done for us. Isaiah 53 tells us he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And he bore our sins. Let us now remember how he died that gruesome death on the cross to redeem us from our sins. Let us recall the things that we are unable to obey, the false steps that we did, the defiance, the rebellion, the perversions that we did, both intentional and unintentional sins. Let us also remember the people that we have not forgiven so that we can ask the Lord for forgiveness. Let us now spend some time for self-reflection and prayer.
Holy Father. We praise you, Lord, and thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to address our problem regarding sin. We know, Lord, that we continue to commit these things that is hurting your heart. Please forgive us, Lord. Help us to be able to see sin the way you look at them. Help us to have the same hatred for sin so that we won't do, it, we won't do them again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for forgiving us. And as we have our communion, please help us to truly be thankful and remember everything the Lord Jesus has done for us. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your mighty name. And all of us say, Amen. Let us now open the first portion of our communion pact. Shall we all stand? On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took up the bread and gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this whenever you eat of it in remembrance of me. Let us remember the Lord together. Let us now carefully open the second portion of our pack. Then after the meal, Jesus took up the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of this in remembrance of me. Let's do this in remembrance of our Lord Jesus. remain standing for the benediction. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. Please be seated and let's hear some announcements. So, good morning, just for a few announcements. The target for this year's mission fund is set at 6 million. Currently, we have received a total of 2.5 million in donations. We are 3.5 million away from our goal. Let's support the MGC missions in order for us to fulfill the Great Commission. Whether you, whether you are new or have been joining us for some time, do stay for a while after the service ends and enjoy some coffee and snacks at the Fellowship Hall. This is a great way for us to connect with and encourage one another. See you there. Thank you very much for worshiping us this morning and see you next week. 